Hello, and thank you for listening. We've been creating UX podcasts for now over eight years. For most of that time, the podcast has been produced and run without any external financial support. We decided a few years ago to stop accepting regular sponsorship, apart from event partnerships, um, in order to keep the podcast independent and free from editorial pressure that can come with paid sponsorship. So if you find UX podcasts useful, perhaps even valuable, then we'd love you to be part of making sure UX Podcast continues to create fresh, relevant content that helps you grow as a designer. Please visit uxpodcast.com slash support and give as little or as much as you can. UX Podcast episode 217. Hello, everybody. Welcome to UX Podcast, coming to you from Stockholm, Sweden. We are your hosts, James Roy Lawson. And Per Axbom. With listeners in 188 countries, from Kuwait to Brunei. In today's show, we pick up on a topic that Chris Nossel raised on the show three years ago. Randomness. Seemingly a broad philosophical topic, it can have some pretty interesting applications in the realms of design and creativity, helping us as humans overcome certain weaknesses. So when we had the chance to sit down with Chris once again, this time at From Business to Buttons here in Stockholm, we let him truly expand on the topic, his thoughts and conclusions. We move from tarot reading through something called haruspication to constrained writing all the way to generative design and the definition of value. So sit back and enjoy some wonderful storytelling by Chris Nossel. We're welcoming back um, for the fifth time, Chris (laughs) Nossel. And you've been been on episode, okay, I'm gonna gonna go through them quickly, episode 25, make it so. That's early. And it's a really early Mm. one. Um, Episode 86, um, the Star Wars, the Star Wars, um, 121, which is agen- agentive technology. Agentive, agentive. I know we differ on our Agentive. Uh, agentive, <laughs> yeah. And then creativity <laughs> we did together with um, Denise um, Jacobs. Mm-hmm. So now for number five. Number five. Yeah. I think we're going we're gonna to follow up on something we mentioned um, back in um, episode 121. Where because people have been waiting for it. They have. <laughs> three yeah. three, three years. Really <laughs> long. Three years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the letters have been coming in weekly <laughs> since March 2016. <laughs> um, we have to ask you um, about the impact of randomness. Um, this is something that came up as a, as a very quick side mention. It wasn't even a side topic during that um, interview. I think it's one of your favorite subjects. But I, I'm, I'm, I think it's going to be really fun because I, I don't really know what this is going to going to Me what we're going to talk about but I'm, <laughs> I'm awesome I'm, I'm sure it's going to be interesting so randomness Chris randomness I it goes back to a story so I am a skeptical guy um, and I, I tend to take a, a skeptical view towards a lot of things I need to see it pr- I need to see proof this goes back to way when I was younger when I was I'm doing the mental uh, 19 years old um, a group of friends of mine on a lark decided to go to a tarot, no, a palmist, a palmist no. who reads palms. Oh, right, yeah. And I was like, guys, this is just, they're just going to bilk us out of money. We shouldn't. But in the spirit of togetherness, I went to the palmist. Um, and everyone had their palm read. And I remember uh, she held my palm at the table and she was like, oh, this is your lifeline. This is your love line. Um, looks like you're going to have two kids. And at the time, I was like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Turns out she was right. I finished it out. I kept my skeptical brain. I said that was probably just cold reading. She was giving generalities with occasional um, specifics when my eyes lit up or something like that. It's like it's a, it's a complex psychological trick. Fast forward five years, and I wind up hanging out with a good friend of mine in Seattle. Uh, and he was getting into Feng Shui. And I recall his, I was like, okay, Brian, tell me about this stuff. Still my skeptical head. And he began saying, oh, well, if you put things on this side, a heavy object on this side of your room, well, it'll affect your love life. And if you put chimes over here, it'll affect your health. And my brain went back three years and connected the palmist to this 
rendition of Feng Shui through Brian. And I was like, those two things are the same. And I could not figure out for eight years why they were the same. That that connection just stayed in the back of my head until I randomly (laughs) came across semiotics. I'd never studied it, um, but uh, I fell into it as I was just, and there wasn't any like formal study. Um, I think it was Understanding Comics, Scott McCloud, that had mentioned semiotics. I was like, well, I love Scott McCloud, so I should look up semiotics. Hmm. And wound up studying it, and and suddenly it clicked for me. And this was right before I went to grad school. I was like, oh, I get it. Um, and it let me not drop the skepticism. I still don't, I don't give any power to the notion that there is a mystical force between behind, uh, divination techniques like Tarot or even Feng Shui, which is not quite divination, um, or any of the other techniques that sort of invoke mystical powers. Um, but there is a semiotic use to these systems that are all quite similar. skip the story part and jump to what the pattern is. The pattern is that there are a whole bunch of systems, sorry to be so abstract, um, but that assign meanings to tokens. This card means death. Mm -hmm. This card means health. Um, This line means children. Uh, This side of your room means fire. Then there is some randomness involved in case of palmistry it's just biology in the case of tarot it's shuffling those cards uh in um rune reading it's shaking a bag full of stones um and then those tokens with those meanings attached are drawn from that randomness and placed inside of some grammar Mm. um so the the grammar is the syntax and uh, they call them spreads in tarot uh well this card that you've drawn that has the, the evil tower on it, is in your present. Oh, that means one thing. Had I drawn it a moment later and it goes into your past, well, that means another. Mm-hmm. Um, in the case of runes, they also have sort of spreads. Um, and lots of divinatory systems. Uh, my favorite sort of ancient one, uh, to do the, my favorite one is haruspication. Crazy old word, but it means for like liver divination. When they used to kill calves and pull their livers out. Um, and if you have any listeners in or near Piacenza, Italy. They can go to a museum where you can find the original Etruscan uh, liver divination. And so what they did is they had the, the, the this little stone shows a map of the liver, and each sort of area around the side in the middle uh, has a little geography that has certain meanings. And then they would look in the liver for perturbations. Oh, a, uh, a black spot meant this, so you would combine the meaning of that black spot with geography of where in the liver to happen. Mm. And they would tell you, oh, we need to shore up our military on the northern border, stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> but all of those share that, that, uh, that same deep pattern, which is um, tokens that are randomized and read inside of a fixed grammar for new meaning. That's it. Well, I was like, ah, thank you, semiotics. You have now answered this uh, eight-year-old question that I've had. Um, and I sat with it. I began to push it through more and more divination systems. And I was like, oh, this is true for a lot of things. Then I began to run into the pattern in two other places that were important to me. The first was entertainment. Mm -hmm. Mad libs are literally a fixed grammar. Mm. Then you hide that grammar from the people in the room and you ask them for prompts and they don't know where that's going. And the randomization comes from just word association. Give me a girl's name. Give me a time of year. Um, And then, of course, that is applied into the sentence. Um, Now, that's not divination. Um, but as I began to collect more and more of those examples, uh, they wound up being just for entertainment value. There are lots of kids' books, like the flip books, mm. where you turn one-third of the page. Mm. Um, my son really enjoys his dinosaur one. And not only are the drawings constructed such that the di- dinosaur always looks cohesive, but they also break up the names. So you might get a Terrorexoraptor mm. or a Triceraorthodix. Mm. Sorry, and that... It was a poor choice of uh, random, random <laughs> words I've had. Uh, sorry about that. We can edit that out later. Um, <clears throat> but it's just pure entertainment, right? Which is like, oh, this is really funny. And there are lots of examples. Um, the One of the cooler ones that I found, oh, was there is a, there's a musical dice game that is ascribed to Mozart. And the idea is that you roll these dice, 
and then you consult a set of tables that are uh, snippets of music to be put together in a piano. Mm. And they create one of like, se- uh, depending on the roll of the dice, the system creates one of 17 million uh, it's a specific type of um, musical piece uh, that uh, can be generated. In fact, there are online versions of it today. So that was the second giant category where this exact same sort of pattern played out. Just for being somebody who likes to think about stuff, that was a cool connection. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I began to find it in another category that meant new, newer things to me, and that was design. So a colleague of mine in grad school had studied at Rome And one of his professors taught something called semiosis of design. And uh, the way it worked is he would take something like a glass and he would have his students write it out as a node graph. So for each part of the object, you would write what its function was. And then uh, in that would be the node. And then you would write a line where it was physically connected to the next part and what that function was. So you'd wind up with a node graph that described the object. You would put the object away and then you would begin to manipulate the node graph. Mm. Oh, I have uh, a stem which lifts the liquid in my glass for like a wine glass off of the table and gives my hand a place to rest and a mechanism for warming the liquid in the glass. Right, that might be part of my node graph. Well, you can duplicate, you can fork, uh, you can rearrange um, that node graph and then you try and take that back into the real world. Well, what does it mean if you separate out uh, a place for your hand to go for warming and a function for lifting the glass off the ground? Well, you might say, okay, well, let's lift the glass off the ground um, with a stem on the left and have a big flat panel that's actually hand size, so that the glass is something that you rest your hand vertically against. I'm this is not a good design. But <laughs> that's kind of the purpose of yeah. this, is that it but is It's a, like the Mad Lib, a, really. Exa- yeah, yeah. It's exactly like the yeah. Mad Lib. Um, it's a manipulation of these signs mm-hmm. and then reread back in the world. In this mm-hmm. case, the syntax is the utility of an object, but it's still a syntax. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the nice thing about the design systems are that divination systems are meant to be interpreted. Entertainment systems are meant to be kind of laughed at, um, or like the surprise is sort of the, the joy of it. Um, but in both cases, you're meant to simply accept the output of this meaning machine as fixed. But in a design system, it's always you interpret it and then build on it. So sure, the um, design a semiosis tool might produce 25 really ridiculous glasses, but one of those may pique your interest as a designer. Um, and you say, I'm going to build on that. I'm going to build this really cool new glass. Um, it's probably more understandable to use, and I should have used a chair example, because there's such a history of in design uh, of different chair designs, yeah, manipulating the the, the 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 what is a chair? Yeah, and it can be anything from a, just a lump of a bag or something on the floor <laughs> to, to to something on a long pole. I mean, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, going off on now all the different mm-hmm. variations of mm-hmm. glasses, but yeah, yeah. So all yeah. these three mm-hmm. systems bear that same um, sense of that deep pattern. Um, they're just simply used for different purposes, um, and uh, I'm I was super delighted to have. Uh, found a way to make that sort of nerd interest super utility because I'm a designer Um, and I'm a writer in addition to other things. Um, And I found the Ulipo. Are you guys familiar with this? Ulipo. Ulipo Ulipo. spelled O-U-L-I-P-O. And it is a portmanteau of several French words and I'm going to murder the French. Um, But it is the ouvrir of literature potentielle. The genre of potential literature. It was a um, genre that was invented in the middle of the 20th century um, by some French writers who created elaborate uh, mechanisms for generating new writing prompts. But let me share with you just a couple of like the um, techniques that they would use uh, in uh, Ulipan writing. So one of them is called the N plus 7 engine. In the N plus 7 engine, you would write a paragraph of text or even a small story. Then you would get a dictionary. Um, the smaller the dictionary, the better this works. Uh, but then you would go through your story and you would find the first noun. You would look up the noun in the dictionary and then look seven entries below it and replace the dictionary entry with the thing that you wrote. Oh, oh nice. Yeah. And you would complete that for the entire story and it would weirdly change the meaning of the story. At first you wrote about 
a bird, go from a bird to a boy. Mm. I had a boy in a cage who sang beautifully. Mm. Suddenly, mm. a weird new mm. story, right, uh, that, that you might not have thought about before. Um, but the, the reader is meant to simply take it as is, as fixed. Um, and it's a be- it's a, it creates beautiful sort of new writings that the author kind of intended, but not really. Mm-hmm. Um, another one is a generation technique um, for character development. Um, by which, if you know a person's name, you can break it down to its atomic elements, deliberately misinterpret them, and then create a backstory or, or, or a story around it. So give me a celebrity, and I'll demonstrate. Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks. Um, so that's his name, breaking it down to atomic elements. Tom, Han, and Kiss. We'll work with that. Um, Tom is also a cat, so let's imagine a cat. Han, we could imagine Han Solo. Oh, Peter Mayhew just died to, uh, earlier oh, today. Yeah. So uh, let's not go there. Um, let's go Han as hand. Let's imagine a cat, a cat that was actually born with human hands. Um, and then Kiss, who falls in love with, it should be a palmist. A cat who was born with hands has a love affair with a palmist uh, that can never be realized. Just given Tom's name, we've now built up this story from these atomic elements. Um, and they would often do that, like they would come up with a name and then write a story around mm. that using this sort of engine. They collected in a, in a, n- like a newsletter format uh, maybe three or four dozens of these techniques, and they are fascinating. Um, and they get you, as a writer, they really get you to places that you couldn't have gotten. Like I would have never been able to construct a story about a cat born with hands in love with a palmist before coming to this room and you're giving me Tom Hanks. Mm-hmm. Um, it opens uh, potentials in ways that uh, our brains aren't good at. Mm-hmm. We're really good at repeating known patterns, but this breaks us up into new amazing possibilities. So it's, it's what we did there was we used, um, we salted the the, the, the in, in encryption methods and you would, you would, you would salt the encryption um, by adding some random thing like Tom Hanks, you'd add that into it and yeah. then it, it creates something that wouldn't have been possible to create in the, in the first place. Mm. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, and uh, so uh, being a writer, I now have tools when I feel like I'm getting stuck and I'm just getting into fiction writing. I did self-published my first piece last year but um, when I get stuck, I now have a ton of new techniques to open my brain uh, to new possibilities and then select one and then build on it and move mm. on. Super happy. Um, additionally, um, my work in AI and at IBM um, has now opened me to the possibility that the all, all previous meaning machines um, are, are bound by physical or cognitive limits. In the case of Tarot, you can't shuffle a deck of 500 cards. So manipulability is you had a cat with four hands <laughs> exactly <laughs> or an octopus with hands um <laughs> you know, i'm not gonna write that short story live on the podcast um uh but uh right there's there's a manipulability requirement to any divination system that has physical tokens and that's a constraint um for language the humans typically have between 10 and 40,000 word vocabularies and that's a constraint on the types of system that Ulipo can sort of give you Computers, notably, are free of those constraints and have access to very complex algorithms. Um, so the, the sort of last manifestation of this pattern that I'm looking for and kind of processing right now in the background uh, amongst with some other stuff is that big patterns, those creativity machines that AI is now going to open the door for us to see and experience new kinds of art that we've never had before. That's so interesting. So I was thinking as he was saying this that so this seems to be one of those abilities that humans have that machines don't but as you were breaking it down i realized well this is something that we can provide the machines so they become much better than us at it yeah Yeah. (laughs) that we call this um generative design Mm. isn't that a phrase for for this kind of thing where Mm. it is yeah um autodesk has generative design and it's essentially uh computizing this design semiosis from that roman professor whose name i can't remember sorry andres van onk who teaches at the isai in rome so I want to give him credit where credit is due. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, yes, generative design has um, qu- quite literally computized those notions. And it'll say, oh, you give it, um, uh, you describe a system like the chair. Um, and there's a, uh, in the Autodesk headquarters in San Francisco, they actually have this beautiful chair where they just said, what we want to do is support a weight in the shape at this height off the ground. And here are the materials and the properties of the ma- those mm-hmm. materials and evolve to the most efficient shape. And eventually it cranks for a long time, evolutionarily, just trying different things and saying, which of these new permutations meets that goal best? 
ah, this one's closer, so I'll now generate off that branch, so on and so forth, until you get to this weird, beautiful chair. It is exactly that. The the difference, and I think the thing that, Perry, you were picking up on is that, um, especially for, like, uh, the meaning machines of language um, re- require up until now and maybe in the near future a human to make those connections. Mm. Mm. Uh, being able to turn Tom Hanks into that story is not something I would expect a, a computer to be able to do well yet. Um, uh, in, in my writing and thinking about this, I call that the Paradolia Bridge. Paradolia is the human ability to find meaning in noise. Mm. Um, and so w- when these machines produce noisy output, we as meaning makers tend to collapse that into something that's constructive or, or that we can use and ignore the rest. Um, and that is the thing that I don't think computers are great at. Um, except the generative design is kind of a counterexample. So, oh, I mean, are we, are we heading uh, for a future where rather than being designers, we're actually evaluators. Yeah. I, I, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I don't mean to be flippant about that, mm. but um, uh, somebody was asking, oh, on stage earlier today, they mm. asked me, like, how will our world change because of agent of technologies? And I do believe that, the, the, that we work within pattern languages, whether they're explicit or not. And I don't mean to be glib about throwing that reference out there. Chris for Alexander created those pattern languages for architecture right back in the 70s. Uh, and I think they opened up everyone's minds in every creative field. And that's kind of how we work. Mm. Notions of visual hierarchy, hierarchy, notions of affordances, they're not rules, but they're guidelines that fit together based on the context. Um, and I think those can be computized, leaving us to be mm. the, the evaluators to say this one is good. Mm. Way back when I was an undergraduate, mm. Uh, I can't believe that I haven't thought about the story in years Um, I wrote I'm such a nerd I I, I wrote (laughs) as a a hobby um, uh, I had scanned Mm. all of these old um, engraving art um, images into a computer and then I I wrote this algorithm that just uh, scaled them and colored them and combined them sort of randomly on screen and I would let that thing just sit and play to my left um, as I was working on a computer in front of me. Um, and then when something caught my eye, literally out of the corner of my eye, I, I could press a, the space bar and it would record that screenshot. And I would use that as a, like a basis for uh, a potential poster in one of my classes. Uh, yeah. um, so I, thank, thank goodness the statute of limitations on my grades mm. have since passed um, because I was kind of cheating, mm. right? It wasn't like a, a muse that was inspiring. Maybe it was a computized muse. Um, but, um, right, it was that randomness that I was like, oh, hey, that, that's amazing. Let's do that. Let's use mm. that. But we are evaluators. And that's what I was doing, mm-hmm. is I was letting my... Um, well, you were evaluating by pressing the space bar. Exactly. Someone else was designing. You were just saying, yeah, like that one. That we can do something with. We can yeah. run with that. Yeah, this, and, this and uh, an evaluator for direction, because I would then build on it. Well, I, I don't want uh, the, the, the engraving of the rabbit there. Um, I want to I replace that with a duck. Um, and then, you know, it was material to build on. And so, yes, we're evaluators, but I also think we can be extenders as well. Mm. Oh, extenders, the yeah. example I'm thinking about is I saw the other day, uh, and it hasn't been verified that it's true, but it seems that a company has invented an algorithm for actually creating photos of models for photo shoots. Ah. So the clothes aren't real. The model isn't real. The face doesn't exist, <laughs> but they look perfect. Oh, my God. Oh, perfect. Well, <laughs> exactly, yeah. based on... <laughs> whatever prejudice has been fed <laughs> whatever requirements are yeah. the magazines yeah. have uh, and so that's so that I, when you say evaluators that is exactly it these designs will be made for us somebody has to evaluate what is perfect what is good uh, and we can't be far off with web designs with all types of designs we just we can stop doing it and we just press the space bar and get all these images and have to evaluate is that good enough yeah, and then like feedback that. no it's not good enough tweak this so building on it yeah it'll it'll mm. generate some mm. sort of base structure that we then say oh, okay i see what you did there but i'm yeah. gonna do something different yeah well they would actually also learn from your evaluations exactly what kind of things generally mm. work for a particular problems so then it would be able to be more efficient at producing examples and this like makes that. me think of all the artists and and painters and, and sculptors who actually don't sculpt themselves because they have a team of people doing it for them oh, yeah. they are evaluators even though they are called the artists mm. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. That's a great that's historical connection. model, mm. right? That <laughs> we 
we used to respect that, that mm. uh, the great masters would, mm. would have a whole, a whole team, team yes. of, of, of um, mm. uh, you don't call them students, do you call them? Mm. Um, apprentices. Yes. Kind of Appren- yeah, apprentices. Yeah, apprentices. Yeah. That was one of them. Yes. Um, but, but we still respect it, and even the history books, my art history books mm. back in undergraduate said that this is the artist. Yeah. Um, mm. Well, it's like the Nobel Prize winners, even. Oh, I yeah, mean, they have a team of people behind them. Mm. Yeah. yeah. But we just... Like mm. our brains work mm. that we need one name to yes. attach to that rather yeah. than the team. Mm. Um, and I, th- I think certainly nowadays mm. we're like, oh, an artist can only be one person. Mm. Um, but no, we're moving to a space where, yes, it will be multiple agents, but yeah. not all of them will be human. Exactly. Now, what, what I'm really fascinated mm. about is to apply the, the McLuhan notion that, you know, we create our tools and thereafter they create mm. us. What happens when – what happens to our sense of aesthetics when computers are providing – the base, mm-hmm. and we're extending them. Mm-hmm. Um, a study that had found that people, uh, l- lay people, tend to evaluate art based on how much effort they think mm-hmm. it took, as well as the aesthetics. Um, but now with computation, like we can create the deep dream, crazy stuff that would take a human years to produce, mm-hmm. maybe. Um, so now we can dismiss those things as, oh, well, that was clearly computer generated, so it's not worth anything. How does how does the set exchange? What changes about what we think we value? I don't have the answers, but I'm fascinated to know. Yeah, so there'll be a, there'll be an evolutionary impact over time because certain brain processes won't be as required, so they won't be developed in the same way, and something else will be enhanced because of the evaluations we're doing instead. Yep. Mm. Yep, 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 and that yep. will have all kinds of interesting imp- implications. Yeah. Like I, I know we do a lot of speculative design, but like the speculative aesthetics. Yeah, uh, be a fascinating way to like look and try and predict which way that computer generated art will push our sense of what art is and even what's valuable. I am so much looking forward to interviewing you again in two years and see <laughs> where we'll be at. <laughs> this is amazing. Thanks again for joining us, Chris. Yeah, thank you, Thanks, Chris. Thank you for letting me nerd out. <laughs> I'm listening back to that interview again. Um, I, I really do realize why we've had Chris as a guest on the show five times now over seven years. He is a special kind of geek, and I use that word with the most utmost of love. I mean, he's the, a nerd. He's a geek. His attention to detail that he wants to give credit where credit is due all the time. He knows stuff that I mean most people have never ever explored. Uh, I had never never heard of haruspication before, and I can't uh, really say it. <laughs> Olipo. Uh, musikalisches Würfelspiel, which I looked up, is what the German. Uh, oh, the dice yeah. um, generator. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, this, I mean, it's, and, and he ties it all together. He, this, he ma- yes. it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So mm-hmm. Chris is um, not just a, a wonderful storyteller, and his ability to recall some of these stories uh, mm. is, is admirable. But mm. he also manages to um, inspire you or to provoke your mind into. Mm continuing the thinking yeah so the story isn't just kind of consumption and that's the end of it he's, he's storytelling at least when we've talked to him um opens your mind up mm. and i right. f- that's exactly for me what this um this interview did and if as a designer i mean your job is sort of to see patterns then i mean i'm amazed by how he can see something uh, and then recall that yeah that is related in some sort of way in this uh node graph way to something I saw that was completely different three years ago. Or 19 and he, years ago. Or and and he, one yeah, and he's been able to tie all this together across the years and finally come to a conclusion about how, how it all works and how it all builds upon each other, which is just mind-blowing. I had to skip back a couple of times when listening to the interview and I realized that, wow, it, it all fits. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. So, I mean, one thing I think we can recommend there is, is go back and listen to this show again. Yeah. I mean, maybe even um, change your um, context. So if you if you if you listen to this while jogging or working out or or doing something that you would normally do while listening to podcasts, try doing it in another environment. Maybe with like, I know you sat down and did a mind map. Um, mm. I sat down and took some notes because there's a lot of things here that you know you can you can spin spin on. You can actually research a little more about and learn some more mm. about. And and this this whole fascinating topics to dive into here that you mentioned yeah and i love actually how i mean he's so excited about ai and what ai can do for us 
uh, often on the show, we can become quite dystopian when we're talking about AI, like in episode 215 when talking with Daryl, uh, although we try to avoid being too dystopian there as well. But I mean, Chris is generally excited about if we can do this properly, the machines can help us make and create fantastic things. And we will become the evaluators, as we were talking about, of these things that the machines are creating. That will be our new job. Well, that was my... I, I put that suggestion too about evaluation. Yeah. And, and Chris added um, that he thinks we'll be extenders as mm. well. So evaluators and extenders. Mm. And and I've been reflecting today about how... Well, there's, there's the other role too. I, connecting it back to what we mentioned earlier in the interview about... Um, um, the, the salting the, the need to to add add a little something um, to the machines to allow them to um, to, to be creative um, that it is going to be our job as well as evaluating and extending mm. then we're going to need to feed we're mm. going to need to provide things such as qualitative data um, and that just a bit like you mentioned that gets us straight into the the issues we talked about with Daryl um, about bias and statistics because we're, we're going to put bias data mm. into these um, systems because um, yeah. it's needed but then it, it's going to feed it that's going to feed into its results and we're mm. going to use our bias to evaluate mm. and our bias to extend and and the AI is going to learn what one designer likes and what another designer likes and they'll design or they'll produce more of what seems to appeal to a certain person as well. So it's even by just deciding and extending, you're feeding back into the system because mm. it's, it's learning as we go along. Mm. Uh, it's becoming very complex though. And by extension, that made me think of why does it stop with us as designers? I mean, if we have mapped up a website's components into different nodes, uh, why don't we allow the users themselves uh, of the systems to actually just redesign the website to suit their uh, whatever they like. Well, it'll redesign itself. Yeah. They can just click a button as well. They, they click the space bar. Here's a new design. Here's a new design. Which one do you like? I'll go with this one. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess it's already mm. in place. That some, some, you, you could use mm. the data to say, well, the user went that route last time. Mm. Um, and then they backed and went this route. So we'll just try this route the next time. So it's, it's kind of like automated A/B testing, which um, I know some tools use, and it's it's mm. perilous in many ways. Oh, and now yeah, and that, now we're getting, into, of course, as we always do, we now would get into ethics then, because should the <laughs> system do this without the person knowing, uh, thus making friction less and them m making decisions without understanding the consequences. So <gasps> there's so much going on in, in, in when we automate. Exactly. Uh, Automate without, mm. I mean, we do so much without understanding the consequences mm. and machines can do it faster. Mm. Now, there's also the risk here. I mean, if we, if we are evaluating all the time and of course we have preferences as individuals, so it all comes down to if we can make exciting new creative stuff, how much, how attuned are we to user experience and understanding users? We need to factor that in as well into this fantastic creation where we are getting the signs by just by pressing a button. I'm so glad that you didn't finish on a dystopian note. Then this, this is a, <laughs> this is a fantastic future, and we don't, and we will we will find a good way of solving all these things. We will. <laughs> Thanks to Chris. Please subscribe to the show if you don't already. Um, our entire collection of episodes is available on Spotify and on the website, and hopefully soon it will be available via the regular feed as well. Won't it, Pear? It should be. <laughs> just need you to just need you to press some buttons for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and a suggestion of what to listen to next, uh, as per usual. Uh, why not give episode one fifty one, liminal thinking with Dave Gray, a listen. Remember to keep moving. See you on the other side. How do you know how heavy a chili pepper is? I don't know. How do you know how heavy a chili pepper is? Give it away, give it away, give it away now. <laughs>
<laughs> that joke is just so 90s. <laughs> <laughs>